Can I take it outside? Go outside. I'm taking it outside! <laughs> what the f- Hello friends, and welcome back to another video. It has all come down to this epic conclusion. I'm deleting my channel after this, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, you know the drill by now, we have been through this. If you haven't seen the past two videos in this series, I recommend you go back and watch those. If you are caught up, let us begin. So this book begins, as all great works of literature, with a condescending explanation. So Greg is essentially telling us that this book is, is very heavily based on his life, that all of his books are largely based on his life, which is really fucking stupid of him. Throwing away his one possible defense in all of this, which is it's just fiction, separate the art from the artist. Like, instead of letting us wonder, like, how fictional this is and if he's really this shit of a person, he just straight up tells us that he is in fact this shit of a person. Many of the things told in these stories reflect who I really was, what actually happened, and what was going on in my mind. Stones to Abigail represented the better version of myself. Many of the events in that book happened in real life as well. This is why I Hate You represented the darker version of myself. Various aspects of that book were derived from my actual life too. But this book, this one is simply myself, who I was, both good and bad, during the time that this story takes place. Chapter one, welcome to the creek. We are one paragraph in and neck deep in daddy issues as usual. He hates religion. He likes a female specimen with no real human characteristics. His bed is hanging from chains by the ceiling. Greg, what? His name is just Greg in this one, so that's... We're finally being transparent, that's nice. Our narrator is still very hashtag deep. He talks about his stepdad and how his stepdad is a very friendly person, tries to make friends with everyone, and from that comment segues naturally into All friends can leave you, my only friends are the trees because they can't lie. So that's cute. Oh wait, we're still on the same page and his name is Daniel now? I think the character's name is actually supposed to be Daniel, he just occasionally fucks up and admits that it's just him. This one is as badly written as Stones to Abigail. I ranked this is this is why I hate you. That was the title of the second one. I ranked in terms of just like the prose itself I ranked this is why I hate you above Stones to Abigail. This one is as bad as Stones to Abigail if not worse And this is the most recent one. So I Also feel like I know Greg's writing well enough now to turn this into a drinking game That would kill me and thinking about having to get through the rest of this. It's tempting right now So Greg's stepdad is building a bed and he asks Greg to help now his stepdad Stepdad's a real daddy. He's a real tall man and Greg admires him for not being fat. Uh, he says healthy, but at, we have come to learn at this point that that basically just means thin and conventionally attractive. The dialogue in this makes me very uncomfortable. It's like, it's uncanny valley. It's almost human, but it's not. It's not correct. <laughs> Hi, Papa, I said as my stepdad chipped away. He looked up with his goofy mustache bending to his smile. Hi there, Greg. I'm making this bed for your cousin Rod. I smiled and replied, oh cool. So then Greg goes up a hill, mansplains some forest vegetation to us, he swings on a rope and everything's great apparently. Then he sees the face of this kid, this like school bully named Philip. He just sees his face and it's super unclear, like is he there to beat him up? Is he- is Greg hallucinating? Did he rip someone's eyes out again? The suspense is killing me. So the verdict is that he hallucinated this kid's face and then he fainted uh, and then he wakes up covered in blood from- he doesn't say what wounds, he just wakes up covered in blood from falling and he's like okay. He walks home, has a brief exchange with his sister in which he notes that her haircut is brown and she is fat. And he, he shows no human emotion throughout any of this lovely day he's having. Now for a scene where he looks in the mirror and describes himself to us. He is 11 years old, but very tall and has a sharp jawline because he's just that much of a chad, I guess. He then cleans his cut, goes to his bedroom to play video games and remarks that his mom will be home from work at five as if it's some kind of ominous foreshadowing. Chapter two, his mom gets home from work. Wild. The mom says one line and then goes to watch TV and we don't see her again. So 
it's just plot twist after plot twist. This is some revolutionary storytelling right here. Greg and his sister decide to go to their uncle's bonfire. They live in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere. There's a creek in it, as I'm sure you surmised already. Um, there's a creek, uh, there's a sketchy ass bridge that they cross, and none of this, none of this is important. None of this means anything. Literally nothing in this book, like, has any connection. Like, I'm reading this and I'm like, I don't remember half of this because it just goes so off the rails by the end of it that, like, <sighs> anyway. I'm picturing this as being narrated by the adult Greg because no 11 year old thinks this. <laughs> Um, he says that his mom should not trust his uncle with her kids because, what was it? Alcohol runs through their bloodline. Y'all okay? <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a medical issue. The night was mostly uneventful till one of my uncles offered me some whiskey. I was mostly opposed to drinking alcohol and drugs in general, but I was even more worried about drinking off the same bottle as my uncle. Strangely, I am more anti-germs than anti-drugs, and I am really anti-drugs. We go from mostly opposed to I am really anti-drugs in about two seconds. Okay. So he doesn't want to drink. His aunt is like, oh come on you silly 11 year old child, it's just whiskey. I feel like I could picture this happening with beer in like the most hick town imaginable, but still. Greg gets mad that his own blood is trying to infect him with a lifelong addiction and he storms off while a bunch of adults heckle him for not drinking whiskey at 11 years old. Once again, he is persecuted for being better than everyone. I'm not even bothered anymore. I'm just tired. <laughs> he broods about how he is morally superior to everyone and then he goes home and goes to bed and has dreams. He is a very special boy because he has special dreams. He sees some alien creatures, hears some non-audible sounds. So an alien sticks its finger in his throat, like not like in his mouth, just like through his throat I believe. Um, and then he wakes up to his super annoying mom, like, singing to him to wake him up after she's, like, packed his lunch for school. That's super annoying. That's the worst, right? Like, God, mom, I was dreaming about aliens trying to murder me. Like, why do you have to care about me? Chapter three. Greg and his sister, uh, her name is Joanna, they meet their cousin Michelle at the bus stop, which... All these people that literally meant nothing to the story that I completely forgot about in the time since I finished the book. Okay. Greg imagines the bus exploding and his sister and cousin being horribly injured. And he's like, teehee, I'm just, I'm just quirky like that. Sometimes I think about horrible violence happening to everyone in my life. I'm just, I'm just not like other girls, you know? Anyway, Greg gets to school. He's, uh, he's super mad that he's in the same class as this girl named Heather, uh, because she hit on him all last year. Is that what you call it when you're... 10 on the playground. Is that how 10 you- okay. She's just super ugly despite having blonde hair and blue eyes. Because that's the usual epitome of human beauty, I guess. He goes to the playground at recess, sits on the swings, he's brooding- <coughs> Now's the time. Okay. It's your the fire services, happy girl. Tomorrow. Now where were we? In the Onion Adventure. Okay, so he's on a swing set, alone at recess, brooding about how alone in he, he is in the world and how his family sucks. And you know, speaking of how completely alone in the world he is, he then immediately sees his best friend. This best friend's name is David. Davis? Davis from Stones to Abigail? Is this character just gonna be Davis from Stones to Abigail? Probably. Let's, let's read on. David tells Greg as a joke that Greg's sister is hot. And Greg's like, God damn, Davis just lives to trigger me. You know, how an 11 year old would make a trigger joke. <laughs> so then he's in class, they're watching a VHS tape, uh, which Greg, Greg, you're just making the old jokes for me now. So anyway, they're watching a VHS tape on dinosaurs. And the narrator of this documentary is like, but what if we combined human and dinosaur DNA? You know, the regular sixth grade curriculum that we all learned. And Greg's like, well, that's stupid and unscientific. But then they show a picture of the human dinosaur hybrid in the, and he's like, oh shit, never mind. That's the alien I saw in my dreams <laughs> in this documentary in class about human di- And then he storms out because He's offended. <laughs> he's, tr he's he's triggered. Um, he's like, how dare they show me that? And he goes to the principal's office. I have been well warned that this is the worst of his books, and yet I still did this to myself and now to all of you. So Greg's like, yeah, you know what? I should tell my mom about this. She's always there for me. 
it, does he have these great supportive people in his life, like a mom he trusts and a best friend, or is he completely alone and misunderstood? Which is it? Whichever one suits the current moment, I guess. So now he's like, I gotta talk to my mom. And so he goes home, and they have some lentils for dinner. Hello, son. Come have some lentils for dinner. When I watched the original Onision book review video that I did, I am just absolutely punched in the face by how gay my haircut was. <laughs> They're at the dinner table. He has another sister. My mom turned to me and asked how I was. I replied. The teacher showed me a picture of an alien on a video, and I cried. My mom's face went from curious to angry in seconds. She replied, they showed you a scary alien at your age? I replied, it had dark black eyes, scales, it had no nose, but it had tiny holes where its nose would be. And they said it was a dinosaur human, but it looked like an alien. My sister Joanna laughed and said, wow, sounds awesome. Also the dinosaur human aliens are coming for him. He somehow knows this, okay. Chapter 4! <laughs> if you ever want to know what it feels like to lose your mind, read this book. David comes over to Greg's house and we learn that he is very into girls. I guess just like as a concept, just all of them. So because David is a giant perv, it's a, bi it's a big event that Joanna is having a friend over as well. Um, and this girl walks in and the first thing that Greg thinks it is important to tell us is that she has the largest breasts he has ever seen. And the second thing we need to know about this girl is that she he doesn't find her attractive. <laughs> because these are the most important things that characterize women. David is very captivated by the fact that women have breasts. Unlike Greg, who would he would never dream of being weird about that kind of thing. All the youngins, David, Greg, uh, Joanna, and her friend, they all sleep in sleeping bags in the living room. After everyone turned out the lights, David began loudly building a plot to somehow get Mara and his lips to connect. That's Joanna's friend. David said, hey, dare me to kiss Mara? I replied, David, no. Yet he did not listen. Giggling, he said, I want to kiss her on the lips. I'm going to do it. Mara then loudly said, um, excuse me? I immediately replied, David, you idiot. And then they all lay there in silence until they go back to school the next day. So now we finally get to meet the legendary Philip, the school bully guy that he hallucinated before. I have also noticed that Greg has mentioned the height, or at least height relative to his own, of every male character in this book. Philip is shorter than him, so we know it's a hashtag deep metaphor for how inferior and beta male-y he is, compared to what an alpha male Greg is, as usual. Hey, ugly! Screamed Philip in my direction. I ignored him. You know I'm gonna beat you down one day, he asked, obviously struggling with however his mom or dad treated him at home. <laughs> I continued to ignore him. I had no interest in making my childhood more screwed up than it needed to be. I need to have a sit down. <laughs> I'm sitting, but I need I need to have a spiritual sit down after reading those sentences with my own two good Christian eyes. Oh god, he's noticed a female. Her name is Aubrey and she's white. But recess is done. We don't get to see where this beautiful love story goes. Um, also, Philip is angry that Greg is not letting him bully him. So he just acts like a shit in their class. He kept interrupting the teacher, and when the teacher finally confronted him about his rudeness, he told her to go F herself. Only he didn't say F. This isn't YouTube, Greg. You're not gonna get demonetized. Greg's like, you know, I just I just feel bad for Philip, you know, with his life being so terrible, and like, my life is so great in comparison. You know, how human empathy usually works. And like, he imagines this whole scene where like, Philip's mom is a drug addict and his dad is abusive, and he's like, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely it. I got it. I have it all figured out. Um, and then he, then he goes home to, to go to bed and have some more dreams, I suppose. Chapter five. His sister comes to wake him up and I imagine him just like sitting completely upright with not a second of hesitation, eyes wide open, because he responds with, hi, how are you? <laughs> On this episode of Does Onision Pass the Turing Test? Anyway, his sister calls him a dweeb and he's nice to her anyway, so that apparently means he's super enlightened and she's a big meanie. This is not an 11 year old child at this point. I am, I am just going to picture the adult Greg like sitting in a sixth grade classroom because that's what this reads as. Greg continues to go on about how bad Philip's life is and he's like, yeah, I understand him, you know? 
I'm a victim too. Like, we're all victims of our parents and the DNA they gave us. I'm tortured too, you know? I've already gone into a detailed fantasy about how your parents are like drug addicts and super abusive and your life is terrible, but like, I'm tortured too. You know, it's really nice to see him fetishize a man's struggles too. That's a quality. So during class, this kid like, sneaks into Greg's classroom and this kid's like, I'm hiding the bad guys trying to beat me up and Greg's like, well, I got a hero complex, so this is my responsibility. He reminds us that he is above average height. And also his mom taught him to fight. I believe this was also a plot point in Stones to Abigail. I can't say, it was one of the first two, but I think it was Stones to Abigail. It was also just inexplicably, his mom taught him to fight and that's why he can go around throat punching all the mean jocks who want to touch his girlfriend's butt. So he grabs this kid, his, his new friend Aaron, um, he goes outside and screams at the bullies. This is how you make friends, right? You, you grab someone who is weaker than you and will listen to everything you say, um, and then you white knight for them, and then you're friends. And Philip is one of the bullies that Greg is confronting, and he's like, Aaron's a punk, you know? How bullies talk. Um, and Greg's like, no, leave him alone. And Philip's like, no, I don't want to. Greg threatens them with a baseball. Not a baseball bat, a baseball and then they all just go back inside. So David goes over to Greg's house that night, and I quote, at home, we did the typical boy things. We would hit on my sister. Oh my God. <laughs> he would hit on my sister. <laughs> I misread that. <laughs> at home, we did the typical boy things. He would hit on my sister. I would dry heave and we would play video games. I can't speak to any uh, personal life experience on this, but leave a comment down below if you were once a young boy and it was totally chill and normal for your friends to sexually harass your sister at the age of 11. After we got bored with games, I saw my bow and arrow set sitting in the corner of my room. Hey David, wanna go shoot stuff? I asked. And Greg's like, I don't wanna shoot living things. So he decides to just shoot some arrows into dead fish in the creek. Also, the fish are not alone in the creek. <laughs> Intrigue! Whose body do you think it's gonna be? So, obviously I know because I finished the book and I'm filming this video, but okay, let's pretend for a second. So I wrote in my notes here, I think our options are Philip, Joanna, and Aaron, or like mystery poor tragic hot girl because this is Greg. I don't think he gives a shit enough about the sister character to even kill her off for the tragedy. Um, it's gotta be someone who's suffering he's already really hyped about. I was like, okay, let's logic this out. Um, he just introduced Aaron in this chapter, so that would be pretty convenient given what a genius storyteller he is. But I decided it was the body was probably Philip because of that part at the beginning where he like hallucinates his face in the forest and shit like that. Okay, I was like, that's gotta mean something. And I was a dumbass, of course, because chapter six, our winner is mystery tragic hot girl. I tried to use logic on this book. I, I am a fool and a dumbass and I deserve to be reading this. He and Aaron are scarred forever by this incident of a woman's body washing up in the creek while they're shooting dead fish. Apparently, uh, this is the adult Greg narrating this for a moment. Um, this book is is supposed to be told by the adult Greg. I, I believe, like, this is a pretty clear acknowledgement that, like, he's writing this from adult perspective. But anyway, then we are back to them at school. Greg decides to ask Aubrey on a date because he needs to take his mind off of finding a corpse and being tortured by aliens and dreams and you know, usual childhood issues that we all go through. Philip is still mad. It it seems like his favorite pastime is just lurking in Greg's periphery and seething with rage on the spot. That's, that seems to be what's going on here. The teacher apologizes for showing him a scary dinosaur alien, human hybrid, because Greg is always right, of course, and everyone who wrongs him must apologize and realize that they are nothing compared to his big galaxy brain. This book is honestly really boring. I know that I shouldn't let my guard down. I've had this spoiled for me, I, I know, but like, Lord, it's just, it's so boring right now. <laughs> so at school, Greg is talking to Aubrey, but, but Philip is being annoying. Um, so Greg is like, oh, fear not, female specimen, I will dispose of him. So he uses his secret badass fighting skills that his mom taught him to just destroy this kid um, who didn't even lay a hand on him before. You know when you totally empathize with someone lashing out because their family life sucks, but then continue to punch them as they cry because you're a normal empathetic human and not a total sociopath who enjoys other people's suffering? They both get taken to the office and Greg's like, why am I here? I'm just defending myself against bullying. He said annoying things, so I attacked him with no warning. I'm in the right. So Greg is sitting in the office with Philip and he's like, yep. That's the last I saw of him, he died. And at the time I wrote, 
He dies in the creek too, doesn't he? He's not even gonna be the last. This book is just gonna be about people dying in a creek, isn't it? You wish past, Tia. You fucking wish. Chapter seven, David tells Greg that Philip did in fact fall in the creek and die. And Greg's like, this is really great. David's talking to me again, you know? He was he was a little busy being, you know, traumatized by seeing a body for a while. And that was, that was pretty inconvenient for my social life. Really glad that we're friends again. Meanwhile, Joanna is just, she's so obsessed with her boyfriend. She doesn't even care that anyone died. This is pretty rich coming from Greg, but okay, let's read on. So he's dreaming about the alien again and compares the way it moves to a kid at his school with Tourette's. We really had to read on, didn't we? Greg's like, wow, I'm really such a special snowflake that this alien wants to kidnap and study me, which is a weird flex, but okay. And okay, and then there's the sequence where he's like telling the alien to stop and like yelling at it and the alien's eyes melts and then Greg realizes he's been actually not dreaming but astral projecting into space this whole time. And so the alien's eyes melt and he gets away and he flies back to his body and as he's flying over his house and over the creek, he sees these red lights glowing in the creek. Chapter eight is called Shook. Greg's sleeping in class and David is like, why are you sleeping instead of playing on the playground? And Greg's like, I get abducted by aliens sometimes. And David's like, LOL, good joke, bro. Let's play on the playground. So Greg and David play kickball on the, on the playground, I assume. And for Greg, this is actually a cover for trying to get closer to the creek. It's cause there's a red glow in there and he, he wants to see what it is. So, um, and then Greg gets hit in the face real hard with the ball and his nose starts bleeding. So naturally he stays completely composed and starts walking into the woods. Um, and David's like, excuse me the fuck? And then in the forest he finds a dead deer. And he's like, of course, I knew it. The red glow signifies death. I have a sixth, sixth sense for death. Cause you know, he's quirky, he's not like other girls. And then he passes out and wakes up in the nurse's office. Why does he depend so often on unconsciousness as a plot device? Take a shot every time someone is unconscious would be a great, great drinking game for this book. So then he goes home and he decides he's gonna investigate more of the red glows around the creek that he sees. So he goes out again and finds some small dead animals and he finds a dead deer. And he's like, that's interesting because there's nothing around my house that could kill it. It sounds like he's setting it up for them there to be some like cryptid in the woods eating the deer or the aliens are eating the deer, but this leads to nothing. This is a setup for nothing. <laughs> Chapter nine, it's spring break now. And Greg plans to spend the entire time in his room playing video games, thinking about how he wants to be a hip teen like all the video game characters, but his these plans are foiled by uh, his mom in announcing that she is having a friend over and that he needs to be nice because this friend is very fragile. Let's see what that means. Greg decides that now is the time that he needs to break the fourth wall in the book to explain things. You know, this, this is the thing that he was worried we were gonna be confused by up until this point. So he uses his big galaxy brain and cool goth death telepathy to immediately deduce that this friend uh, of his mom's is distraught and in denial about the fact that she's had a miscarriage. His mom ends up convincing her to go to the ER. Also, this is just apparently the kind of lighthearted conversation you have over dinner with your children present. And Greg's like, oh man, spring break is ruined because I got to think about death again. He almost, he almost has a moment of self-awareness where he's like, maybe it's selfish for me to think about myself in this situation where I'm not really the one suffering but it's very brief. This is still all about him and how, how hard it is to be cursed by this knowledge of other people's suffering. So Greg tells David about this and David doesn't really want to talk about upsetting things. This makes Greg not respect him. It's just beneath him. It's, it's weak. And then Greg just has this galaxy brain moment, I guess. And he's like, oh yeah, that twitchy weirdo in special ed who reminds me of an alien. Because that's a thing you should say about a human person. And he's like, hmm. I started seeing that kid around the same time I started dreaming about aliens. Something's afoot. Too bad I can't ask who this kid is or else I'll get accused of a hate crime. I'm pretty sure you're allowed to ask who disabled people are. There's an issue here, but that ain't it. Things are kind of lonely now because, you know, David's not enlightened enough for him and things are a little bit awkward with Aubrey after he'd like beat up a guy in front of her and then that guy died a week later. I hate when that happens. Chapter 10 is called Your Dead Girlfriend. Who's girlfriend? In Greg's dreams, the aliens take out his eyes and put them back in again, and also his heart. Thrilling, I, I am thrilled. He wakes up to his mom singing again, and he's like, God, mom, shut up. And his mom's like, excuse me, son? But then he realizes that his chest is bleeding for real. 
uh, and they take him to the ER. They wait for hours in the ER and Greg's like, well, I guess chest bleeding isn't a big issue to them, which what you've described is like a cut on your chest. If your condition isn't life-threatening, you're gonna wait in the ER. Who even goes to the ER for like a cut that's not infected or doing anything particularly weird? And then they finally get in and the nurse's questions are so boring and mundane. God, annoying medical professionals who devote their lives to trying to help people. The doctor looks at it and is like, yep, that's the cut. You probably scratched yourself in your sleep by accident or on purpose, you little emo. Okay, bye. So his entire family, including his sister, who came along because she was worried, um, have wasted their entire day in the ER over a cut that needed no treatment. But you'd think before going, one of them would have looked at it and been like, yeah, that's a cut. Slap a band-aid on it and have fun at school, son, you know. A normal reaction to a cut. I guess this is what we should expect. Greg's dream world is one where everybody freaks out and uproots their entire day over him having a cut. And driving home, they get into a car accident. So Greg's entire family is fine. Uh, the guy driving the other car is also fine. Uh, but the other guy's girlfriend just died instantly. And Greg is the only one who notices this. But this time he doesn't see a red glow. He looks at her and feels cold. So anyway, the guy who was driving the other car was apparently the one that hit them. So he gets out and starts apologizing profusely to Greg's family. Um, and Greg just looks at him and is like, hey dude, your girlfriend's dead, by the way. How does he even know it's his girlfriend if they're strangers? It could have been his sister if he was driving somewhere. I don't know. But anyway, so the guy's like, oh my God, she is dead. And as usual, nobody in this book has any believable depth. They just kind of act out emotions on the surface level and it's just, such a boring reading experience. His family walks home. They, they just they just walk away from the car wreck before the authorities even show up, I guess. They just, they just walk home to, and I quote, self-medicate. How does an 11 year old self-medicate? Also, what happened to the second sister? Did Greg completely forget about her? I don't know. So anyway, at dinner, his stepfather is like, now Gregory, how did you know that woman was dead? And Greg's like, oh my dear stepfather, I get abducted by aliens. And his stepdad's like, LOL, okay. I like, I'm in a totally joking mood despite the day that we've had. Feel free to tell me the truth anytime, son. And Greg's like, no, really, it, it ripped out my heart last night. Could you not tell by the insignificant cut on my chest? And his dad's like, Good night. Greg then foreshadows that weeks later, he is to ruin some lives. Can't wait. Chapter 11. Greg's laying in bed like, God, life is so emo. My name is Gregory Darkness Dementia Ravenway. One of his teachers had a heart attack and died in class, and Greg saw his soul, and it had a tail. Greg is a furry confirmed, I suppose. I love the focus on how misunderstood he is and how no one will listen. When like, if a kid told their parents they were having nightmares about being tortured every night, you better believe that would be an issue. But no, he keeps phrasing it like, I got abducted by aliens and they gave me magic death powers. Uh, so that he can, he can continue to be misunderstood and a poetic misfit, I guess. What was this? This was my... Gregory Darkness Dementia Raven White Hair. One night, Greg's mom is like, hey son, go to bed. And he's like, never fucking make me go to bed, mom. And she like slaps her belt against his door as a threat. And he's like, beat me all you want. I'll never go to sleep. And then she screams to call the hospital and he runs out and she's suddenly bleeding, bleeding profusely from her eyes. She's unconscious because who isn't in this book? Um, and then he, he realizes that her eyes are gone. Her eyes have melted, <laughs> but then they reappear and, and she wakes up immediately and she's fine. <laughs> and also the dad and Joanna are here now. I really think he just forgot about the second sister and everyone is like, what the hell just happened? I, I, I guess it, I guess it was the aliens. And so the first responders show up and the whole family's just like, yeah, we called because like her eyes got stolen by aliens, but they're, they're back now and she's fine. And the mom's weirdly smiling and, the first responders are just like, yep, okay guys. The next day Greg is at school and David tries to talk to him. So Greg screams at him to go away. And then Greg eats, he eats lunch alone because he screamed at his only friend. Sometimes when I got thirsty, I would just drink my chocolate milk and think about how much I hated everyone at this point. And then a voice behind him creeps up and goes, hello there, Gregory. Remember that time the other day you melted your mom's eyes? You know, you've melted my eyes too. And I've 
also melted people's eyes. And Greg's like, ew, a sociopath nut job is talking to me? Of course, it's the special ed kid. Uh, so he sits down at the lunch table and eats Greg's apple and he's like, I can take care of more people for you. But it's okay if like you're in shock right now, this can wait. And Greg's like, you know, actually that's really considerate of you. Like that works. Like I've, I've peed myself from shock. So can we do this another time? And the kid's like, yeah, totally cool. Schedule it for later. And Greg dumps chocolate milk on himself to cover the fact that he peed himself and that's the end of the chapter. Chapter 12, so apparently the kid is the alien in his dreams and is now extra torturing him by watching him all day at school. One night Greg is like, obviously the aliens can't get me if I'm under metal. So he wraps himself in tin foil um, and instead of dreaming about being tortured by aliens, he dreams about a naked woman who looks like his teacher trying to seduce him in a field. However, he does wake up to the special ed kid screaming outside of his window to stop making things difficult. Fucking uh, tin foil. Who would have thunk it? So this kid slash alien is just super cryptically like, I'm trying to help you, Gregory. It's them you have to worry about. Naturally, Greg's stepdad then goes full redneck and runs outside like, get off my property freak and then the roof of their house gets ripped off and Greg gets beamed into a flying saucer while his dad attempts to shoot it with a rifle so he wakes up and there's some aliens doing their alien probes again um he's missing an arm but that's okay because they just reattach it immediately also he knows with his big galaxy brain that they're actually undoing something that was done to him and then he wakes up back in his bed. There's a hole in the roof above his bed now, so I guess they just yeeted him back in there. So how shall we deal with this interesting night that he's had? My front room had three police officers in it, as well as my sister's mom and papa. I stood there for a moment, rubbing my eyes as they all continued to talk to one another. Joanna screamed, Daniel, and immediately ran over to me. Sisters plural though. Interesting. Now this, this is the mystery I'm invested in. One of the officers spoke up. Ma'am, y'all said your eyes exploded out of your head the other day. We show up, your eyes are fine. I'm not gonna do that accident. You say your kid is taken by aliens the other day. Your kid is right here. Can you explain? My papa stopped hugging me and turned to the officer. He said, listen, we'll handle this. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. The officer replied, we're probably going to have child services pay you a visit. This seems like an unstable home, both mentally with the mom thing and physically with whatever you did to the roof. And they're like, wow, what an asshole who totally talked like a normal person. We're definitely not calling the cops next time something dangerous happened. The next week, the alien who's pretending to be a kid creeps up behind Greg at school in the bathroom while he's taking a piss and is like, I need to give you back what they took and knocks him out. Take a shot every time someone's unconscious, I swear to God. Chapter 13, so we're in a flashback now. Greg mentioned at the very beginning of the book that he spends summers with his biological father in Ohio and that there was a female there. So I guess now we get to figure out what happened with that. The bar is so low that I'm relieved we find out her name before we find out the size of her boobs. Her name's Julia, also she has brown hair and she is short. How compelling. She is also four years older than Greg, which is 15. I, I can't even pretend right now to hope that she's his babysitter. People have been messaging me about this hysterically for months. It is exactly as bad as what you are assuming right now. <sighs> Come on, Tia, you can do it. Her name is Julie now, though. They play darts romantically and he is entranced by her. Every 15 year old, every Mentally healthy 15 year old on this planet sees something wrong with flirting with an 11 year old. Again, I know where this is all going, but I wrote, Greg, if this book does not condemn her for being an actual fucking pedophile, I don't even know. Like, it is an experience to learn about yourself that you still have the most minimal expectation of decency from even Onision and to have that crushed. They know each other from this like church social group that his dad is a part of. As usual, religion bad, Greg, big boy galaxy brain. There's no point in praying for your loved ones who have cancer because God gave them cancer, etc. But prayer circle means you get to hold hands. Tell me, Gregory, 
What are her arms like? We then learn, my mom left my dad because he was accused by her two sisters and her own child of being inappropriate to an illegal extent towards them. A bunch of the church kids are frolicking through a pond together and the only purpose of the scene is for this other kid to be like, hey Greg, I think Julie has a crush on you. Sounds inappropriate to an illegal extent to me, but okay. Then they go inside, this is all still happening at a church gathering, and Julie tells Greg that she wants to shower with him, and he's like, really? And then she leaves and he's like, oh man, I blew it, and I have no idea what's happening, and I don't want to know either, but ah! Uh. The church group goes on this trip to a cabin. All the kids are sleeping on the floor in sleeping bags. Julie is staring at Greg. Just staring, she just smiles and stares at him. As usual, we scroll very quickly past the sex scenes in horror. Press F for my last brain cell, friends. Kids are dumb. An 11 year old may very well not be able to see this situation as abusive, but we've established that this, this book is not narrated with the ignorance of an 11 year old. It's narrated by the adult Greg with perspective looking back, but apparently not the perspective that pedophilia is bad. Chapter 14, I thought that the beginning of this chapter was a dream at first because what the genuine fuck is going on? He's on the flight back from Ohio and the flight attendant is like, hey kid, why didn't you impregnate Julia? She's gonna sleep with more guys now that you're gone, ha ha. Someone else on the plane laughs and it's a familiar voice, but he, does, he doesn't actually say who it is. What the fuck is happening? This book is exactly like the second book where it feels like multiple different books clumsily morphing into each other as you go along because it's just Greg getting bored and deciding he wants to write something even dumber now. He's walking off the plane and one of the bathrooms is slightly open. So of course he looks in, cause that's, okay. He So he looks in and he sees the alien in the mirror and where, where in the timeline are we? I thought this was still a flashback. What the fuck? So he runs off the plane and then he's like, you know what? Actually, I'm sick of this. And he runs back past the flight attendant. She's like, oh, excuse me. But Greg is a badass on a mission. He grabs a fork, he runs into the bathroom and he stabs the alien, AKA the, the special ed kid. He stabs him in the throat. So at this point I was like, he has to be dreaming. The, the flight attendant, Falls unconscious, obviously because the alien was controlling her telepathically. At this point I was starting to wonder why there was only one flight attendant on this plane, but all of the other flight attendants run over to her, absolutely nobody notices at all that Greg has just stabbed another kid in the neck with a fork. They just, they just don't notice this. Now the alien is shedding its human skin and assuming its true alien form and nobody notices this happening in an airplane bathroom. Greg just slips back off the plane and goes and joins a sister and she's like, LOL, where were you? This book went from bad to I am having a stroke immediately. That night he falls asleep and he's back in space on the alien spaceship and there's a guy in front of him who he describes as looking like Agent Smith from the Matrix but with a large head. Greg screams so loud that he makes the skin peel off of Agent Smith's face and then makes his head explode. And then more aliens rush in and Greg screams about how he wants them to die and their heads explode. And he gets a, then he gets ejected from the spacecraft, but he's like, no, no, not yet. Instead of flying back to his body, he flies back to do some more murdering and he realizes it's not the screaming he can murder with his galaxy brain. Now, as he is actively conducting his murder spree, he decides to have a good think about things. He now knows, somehow, that the alien he murdered on the plane was actually a good guy who was trying to protect him from all these bad aliens, and when he murdered him, he saw remorse in his eyes for a moment, and I... I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit this book. How is this book so insane and so mind-numbing at the same time? It's a work of genius. Uh, then he visualizes, a, he gets sick of murdering all the aliens one by one, so he's like, I'm bored now, and just visualizes a bomb to blow up the rest of their ship. And that's that, then he wakes up in bed. Chapter 15, the aliens haven't bothered me for years. Maybe they didn't send out a distress signal. Maybe they're afraid of me. I've been keeping myself busy with my abilities. I've learned to levitate on command. I've learned to cook food with my thoughts. Fuck. Fuck this book. Okay, let's get this straight. Greg has magic powers. The bad aliens 
were trying to stop him from having magic powers. The good alien, who he murdered with a fork as thanks, was trying to undo the stopping of the magic powers. And here we are. And Julia's here too. Yay. And now she's 18, which makes Greg? Ew. So Greg's in class and they're getting this like safety lecture thing and about how not to get hurt. And this kid raises his hand and is like, but what if I want to hurt people? And Greg looks at him and knows that he's an alien. That was when I decided he should die. Moments before I severed his ability to breathe, reality glowed around me. The lights, the skin of all the students, the teacher's bald head. It was like I could see everything I needed and it all shined. In the moment my existence demanded it, I knew everything I needed to know. I didn't need to hide anymore. I realized nothing could hurt me. The alien underestimated me. And when I was done deciding his fate, when I was done soaking in the reality of my situation, and numerous factors saturating the air, like whispers in my ear had all spoken their piece at once. You haven't said anything. <laughs> Literature. Why is this not what I'm studying in school? Speaking of which, remember that time Greg tried to fake Stones to Abigail being taught in a university? That was comedy gold. Chapter 16. Apparently all of this is happening because of a magic rock in his brain. Oh my god. I need another shot. His powers also now make everyone love him and everything go the way that he wants all the time. Davis was smiling across the room from me. Two pretty teachers with cleavage showing stood by waiting for me to address them at the entrance of the room. I looked at all of them and I smiled. Something's about to change, I said. The teacher with larger breasts than most anyone I've seen replied, What do you mean, cutie? And click, just like that, their smiles faded. Both teachers were overcome with the expression of confusion and immediately left the room. Is... is Greg okay? Like the actual Greg, like the man writing this. Like, I think he's finally lost it. Because he, he wrote this this year. We also find out that his mom ended up leaving the stepdad because he became an abusive alcoholic because that makes total sense and was foreshadowed very well before. So he's, he's basically, Greg has now flipped this cosmic switch that makes everyone hate him or what? He's making everyone hate him now instead of making everyone love him because that was fake and wrong and he decided he didn't like it anymore. He calls Julia, Julie, whatever the hell her name is, he calls her and he, she still likes him and he's like, but that's because she doesn't understand who I truly am. And so he beams some thoughts to her mind so that she understands all the weird alien shit that's been happening and all his superpowers. And she's like, of course I still like you. Come over and see me immediately. And he tells his mom that he's leaving for a bit and she apparently sheds a single tear and tells him that he can't because he's too young. He's only 14, which is the first reasonable thing I've heard in this entire book. But what his mom thinks obviously doesn't matter. Greg can fly now, so he flies all the way to Ohio and lands on Julia's porch. She comes out of the house. She is only wearing a towel and he is very tall. And then she gets shot in the forehead? Chapter 17. Julia just got shot in the forehead, but now it's her neck. Literally on the same page, it's changed. As usual, Greg does not emote at all at the sight of his girlfriend getting shot in the head, which for the first time I'm okay with. I think we all agree that if you think it's okay to sleep with 14 year olds, you can die. The aliens for some reason decided to send a human assassin who was also wearing a red polka dot suit because that's suitable for a super covert murder mission. Anyway, it's punishment time. Greg also decides now to reveal that actually there are lots of aliens living on earth in human skin but not anymore. It's murder time. He's he's gonna murder everyone now. He's like, you know, I could just kill them all remotely with my mind because I have literally the biggest galaxy brain, but I want it to be personal. So I'm going to astral project to all of the aliens individually and murder them. None of these aliens have wronged me personally. And you know, there was that one guy who was trying to help me. So clearly they're not inherently evil. Like, I'm just in a genocidal mood tonight. And Greg even murders some aliens in the bodies of children and their parents are upset about it. But sometimes 
Sometimes they don't have fathers. This is important to mention because Greg has daddy issues. So the whole alien genocide thing takes about 17 hours, but in another realm of existence, it's hashtag deep, you wouldn't understand. So he yeets his soul back into his body, like pretty much immediately in human time so that he can finish murdering the human assassin who shot Julia. I spoke to him. I want you to see how pointless what you have done is. He looked at me with a smile in his eyes, showing his teeth. <laughs> Just imagine like the teeth in his eyes open, like his eyes are mouths. In a half grin on his face as blood seeped out of his mouth, he gurgled, I don't fear you. I replied, Julia? The man looked at me trying to hold back his confusion, masking it with false confidence. Julia sat up in bed. The light her soul filled the room with was gone. Without much thought, I had returned her to this world and given her all the information she needed to know. So Julia's pedophile Jesus now, I guess? Julia blinked a few times and looked at me holding the man against the wall with blurry eyes. You're naked, she said. I replied, and it's not just your blood that I'm drenched in, darling. I was like, you know what, I don't actually want to kill this assassin, I only want to kill people who are threats to me, which makes complete sense given that he just murdered a whole bunch of people slash aliens who literally didn't do anything to him. So anyway, he just yeets the guy away and it's fine. And we're meant to accept that all of this makes total sense. Now is the time for romance, apparently. I would like to vomit. Julia doesn't seem particularly shaken by having just died, but I guess trauma would be kind of inconvenient for Greg right now, so she's totally fine with it all. He makes her another galaxy brain stone so that they can be together forever. She wants him to impregnate her, etc. Greg is like, galaxy brain moment. There's innocent people out there. I just, I just can't stomach all of the violence and chaos in society. It's too much for my fragile heart. Kay, no more mental illness. I'm going to cure everyone, I said. She replied, so no more therapy, no more medication or disorders for anyone? I smiled and said, I don't know of anyone who wants to be damaged. She added, is being damaged what makes us us? I was at a loss. I had a loaded gun without a trigger. <laughs> I'm ready to die. That was right out of Stones to Abigail, honestly. Greg is also able to edit human biology in real time now. He can just change everyone in the world. So he decides it's time to make some much needed changes, such as gender equality and steel fingernails. I mean, those are the two things I think are the most wrong with the world. <laughs> Chapter 18, Greg's powers mean that he can fulfill Julia's every desire, which is good because it means he can completely possess her because that's how romance works. So they're chilling just in the clouds, just just chilling up there because they're superhumans now. So they're chilling in the clouds and she's like, I want to visit my old family house. And he's like, okay. So they fly there and while they're flying, her pants keep flying off because I, does she wear really loose pants? They get to Julia's old house and her dad immediately chucks an ax at Greg and demands to know where Julia is um, because I guess he didn't A, see her standing right beside Greg or B, realize that he couldn't answer that question if he was hit with an ax. But actually it's fine, her parents are completely okay with this entire situation as soon as they find out that she went with him consensually. Time for a nice family dinner. This is Julia's father speaking. He spouted out, so women have teeth on their crotches now, eh Daniel? In the middle of drinking my lemonade, I tried to swallow without a hiccup. Clearing my throat, I replied, yes, I thought that would make sense. Her dad looked concerned. What do you mean? I replied sincerely. I mean, men have their swords. Women should have their blades too, right? Right, we currently live in a society where men take swords to all of their Tinder hookups. In that moment, I saw into his mind without even inquiring. I saw all the women he hurt. He had even attacked Julia's friends when she was younger. He was a serial predator. And the moment I realized what he was, he dropped dead face falling flat in his noodles. Then he beams his thoughts to Julia, so she immediately knows everything he just found out too. There's no suspense to anything when your protagonist is just all powerful, but anyway. She beams her thoughts back to him, and she's like, yeah, I guess you did the right thing killing a child predator, which is fucking rich coming from another child predator, but... So she's like, yeah, I guess you did the right thing, but like also he was my father, so like we gotta mourn. He's like, all right, and materializes a coffin and some money for their family, and then he leaves. They don't tell her mother because 
and this is almost verbatim, the, the knowledge that her husband was a child predator might send her into a depression and cause her to kill herself. I don't know, I think she handled her daughter bringing home a 14 year old boy who she's been sleeping with since he was 11 pretty well. Chapter 19. Greg has total control over the laws of physics and can just edit anything about the world in real time, which is super boring. There's no stakes to any of what is happening. Why is any of this happening? Because these books exist to fulfill Greg's weird power fantasies. That's right. That's, that's right. Greg's doing his thing, being all powerful. He descends through the earth around the creek where he grew up and he finds that there is 14 sex workers buried there, all put there by a man named Gary. Intrigue. Greg decides to come out of the fucking dirt finally and his grandmother is standing there. When she was never mentioned. I think like maybe his grandparents house was mentioned. Okay, ah, <laughs> I try not to lose my mind. So she's just there and she's like, what's going on? And he responds by shaking the water off of himself in slow motion while his hair turns blonde and grows longer. Now my first thought at reading this was that he was going to transform himself into an attractive blonde woman to lure Gary in and murder him, but that didn't happen. Literally his hair, it just, just, just happened. So Greg flies away. Uh, pausing only briefly to comment on the fact that his grandmother is dumb for believing in God. But wait, while he's flying, the mysterious physical transformations continue. Greg is becoming a Chad. Apparently he's not even using his powers to make this happen. It's just happening. Greg just had a magical girl transformation, except he aged 15 years and got conventionally attractive. Also, his soul looks like a Chad too, which is very important. Wouldn't want your soul to look like an incel. Gotta make sure you get those ladies even when you're astral projecting. He did mention earlier in this book though that souls have tails. So the soul is at least a furry Chad, just saying. Then he rolls up to Gary's Christmas tree farm. And by rolls up, I do mean bursts through the house like the Kool-Aid man and rips off his limbs while he's alive. Conveniently, Gary kept a bunch of framed photographs in his house of all of his murder friends. You can tell that they murder people together because they're all wearing plaid. Who's gonna tell Greg about lesbians? <laughs> Cause like someone really should, his last book indicates that he doesn't have the strongest grasp on the concept. Five of the murder bros, Greg just wills them to die. The other two, he leaves alive so that he can question them. The first guy is named Raymond and Greg accidentally murders him because he is so filled with rage after reading his mind and seeing what happened with the murders. And then Raymond's wife comes out and says some, some boring generic stuff Greg doesn't care about that people always say when he murders their loved ones. God. The final guy is named Joseph, who by the way we shouldn't respect because he's overweight. Greg lands on Joseph's porch and demands to know why those women were murdered. Joseph makes no indication that this is a strange or unexpected situation and immediately spills his tragic backstory about how Gary murdered his wife and pressured him into helping with the rest of the murders. Greg brings back the soul of Joseph's wife and then he kills Joseph and his, his soul goes out to join his wife. His soul is a thin guy, by the way. That's, he literally says that. Anyways, as Greg is flying away, he gets sucked up by a yellow beam, which we can assume is God, because that's what the next chapter is called. Chapter 20, God. You're not as powerful as you think, Daniel. A voice came from the white glowing light above me. Looking back, I called up. I didn't ask for any of this. I don't care about any of this. Also, God is like, a steampunk skull. So take world building notes, George R. R. Martin. But then God turns into a total Chad and is like, no, no, Gregory, you're disturbing the natural order, which is now the time? Is, is this where the line is drawn? This was not an issue at any point up until this moment. And Greg's like, okay, but wait a minute. You just turned into a cool Chad, but you're not really a cool Chad. I know you're some like arts and crafts, dark mark looking thing. Um, and God's like, ah, Gregory has outsmarted me. So he turns back into a skull and rips Greg's spine out as you do. Okay, so the skull guy is now referred to as the Reaper. Greg's all spineless and ripped apart, but still somehow alive. And he, he's, he reads the Reaper's mind and he sees all of the unjust deaths he has caused, which always seem to revolve against violence and rape, but not because Greg's a fucking weirdo or anything. As our one dimensional bad guy of the hour, the Reaper is like, you can't defeat me, you meddling kids. <laughs> Greg kills him with the gray, material. Greg makes himself a new body, which of course looks exactly like the old cool Chad one. Now we're about to go full galaxy brain here, 
Only 500 IQ chads can understand. I had to alter the code of reality again to extract the origin of the Reaper from a state of compression that didn't exist before. As I scanned the data before me, I found the source of death. It aligned closely with what most humans considered God, but in the code I also saw a truth many had never imagined. God was not the source of all things. God was just another son. He created evil, like death, because he was evil himself. The devil never really existed, as people had believed for so long. The devil was just an aspect of God's divided personality, like anyone's father when he was in the worst mood. Jesus fucking Christ, the daddy issues. Every crime, every tear that fell was caused by God. He created death. He created our suffering and he sent the reaper to end me. The code before my eyes revealed God's face and the expression he had when he sent death to me. He was not too busy to handle this himself. He was just afraid. God is afraid of Gregory Darkness Dementia Waven Way. Confirmed. Also, they're all furries. Diving deeper into the code, I could see God's father, a man by the name of Ko. So Greg tries to telepathically find out where God is, but it comes back with three locations. We got three God locations. He also, he made himself a new body, but he also resurrects the old body. So now we have two identical Greg Chads on their way to fight God. This is not where you thought this book was going, was it? This, you had no idea that this was the place you were coming to. But before we fight God, of course, we have to see his obligatory slice of plain white bread of a girlfriend. I think you might be too old for me now, Daniel. She said with a smirk, observing my new appearance. I laughed and grabbed her by the throat. Ah, uh, I think, I think, I think that was supposed to be romantic. Yep, yep, fuck everything about this book. He wants her to help him kill God, you know, cute couple things to do on a Friday night. But she's like, no, Greg, I can't, I'm too weak. I'm not like you, cool Chad. Meanwhile, the body, AKA the second Greg Chad, um, has already defeated the first god, so now it's it's time to go to the other two locations. Chapter 21, apparently god looks like exactly what we would all expect. Bold of you to assume I don't think god is Ellen DeGeneres, because I do. So anyway, the two Gregs defeat god in about less than a page. Who wants to read about a guy who can defeat god in less than a page? So after this very brief but apparently strenuous battle, Greg collapses and he's carried away by the body. Um, and he takes a moment to note um, how huge and strong his arms are. What is this vaguely homoerotic comment about a clone of himself? The absolute peak, the conclusion of all of Greg's narcissism. He becomes his Chad Sona and then fucks a clone of his Chad Sona. I was very disappointed that this was not how this book ended. Also, he can't read the body's mind, so this is this is gonna be some Edward and Bella shit, my guys. Actually, he can't read the body's mind because he had to switch to another cosmic operating system to defeat God. I've given up. I've given up following all of this convoluted bullshit. But anyway, now it's time to kill the third God. Tell me, God, does the devil really exist? Because I can't sense him anywhere. God laughed and the body interrupted his laughter. It was a rhetorical question, God. I'm well aware there is no devil. I'm well aware if there was a devil, he would have been one of the first God haves I already killed. I'm well aware that you are a failure of your father, Cole, and I know that this world wasn't even your creation, but rather the creation of your sister you murdered, the daughter of Cole, and you took her life right before the first genocide you committed against her creations. What does it say about Greg that he writes a world in which even God himself hates women and has daddy issues? I don't even want to know at this point. I just want to be done with this stupid book. Greg and the body have the only relationship of like genuine respect and friendship that I have ever seen in any of his books. It turns out Greg actually is capable of friendship, just just with a clone of his Chad Sona. Next, they debunk a whole bunch of Bible stories about how evil stuff in them was actually done by God the whole time. Galaxy Brain isn't even required to know that God does real fucked up stuff in the Bible, but okay. Chapter 22, so Greg and the body are just tormented by the collective screams of the world. Um, and the tragedy, and they, they have to fix the world. So they decide they're gonna go find Kull, who is the father of God, if you were not following this psycho nonsense as closely as I am forced to. So it turns out Kull is an old dude sitting on a throne, and, you know, I don't know about you, but I certainly have a preconceived notion that ancient gods sitting on thrones are 
gray. Good thing Greg cleared that up. You know, if, if this guy was blue or some shit, that would, that would be too far. Can you imagine? Cull immediately starts to cry when he sees Greg, and Greg understands that it's because he knows that all of this is because of his failures as a father. Oh my god, resurrecting Freud would be so worth it right now. Someone get on that. I know that you are incapable of bringing your children back. I know the pain you feel. I have seen much of your life play out before me through the many lines of code that make you what you are, Cull. Cull replied, somewhat agitated, We are more than code. My son and daughter were living, breathing gods. So you're a god and you named your son God? So Greg resurrects God's sister. She doesn't have a name, but I really hope it's like Karen. These are my children, God and Karen. And Greg's like, all right, cool. I, I guess that's, that's it. They're gonna run things better than God, I guess. My work is done. I'm out. We good. Chapter 23, Greg is apparently dead to his family now because of the thing that happened with his mom's eyes, even though they were all totally cool with it before, but now I guess we need a reason for them to have all disowned him. So it's the, it's the time when he melted his mom's eyes is what they've decided to be mad about. Fucking because. Therefore, now the only people in the world who love him are Julia and the body. Ooh, a love triangle. Julia's Jacob. Greg shows up to see Julia and she's taking a bath and she's like, oh, I just like, I just like the quirky human things in life. You know, like I'm not like other girls. Like I could obviously, I'm like a god. I could just make it so that I never get dirty. This scene is definitely not because Greg is a total chad and he sees naked girls and we need to be told that Greg gets to see naked girls. I'm sorry for being so dis dot dot dot. I cut her off mid sentence with a kiss. Is that a thing people do outside of shitty books? I feel like you would just smack into their teeth. The whole thing about him murdering her father comes up, you know, that little inconvenience, and he's like, I love you, Julia. I'm sorry my actions have hurt you. And then everything's fine. He wakes up one morning and the body is just looming over his bed, presumably waiting for him to wake up, which is not at all acknowledged as weird, nor is the fact that they still need to sleep which I assume they choose to, but why? That's literally the first thing I would change if I had superhuman powers for some reason. Anyway, the world is a perfect utopia now. God's sister is like, hey, yo, Greg, like, I know where, like, the bad aliens who, like, started the whole plot to torture you as a child are, like, if you want to go get them. So Greg and the body, like, at this point, I'm just picturing them both as He-Man because I have to enjoy this somehow. They fly off to find the aliens and end up deciding to give them a chance. They create a translator so they can understand the aliens and it turns out that actually evil god was behind that whole thing as well. So I guess it's all solved. So then we find out this has nothing to do with the aliens or them going to find the aliens. The body literally just knows all of a sudden. Like, what is it? I, I literally, this shit is so tedious to follow. Okay, we find out that the magic black stone that makes Gregel such a special, special boy was actually created by his real mother, who is God's sister. So Greg and the body share a homoerotic embrace, and the body makes fun of him for thinking that his mom was hot. I don't think he even did that. This is not referencing any previous line where he called her hot. This is just... And Greg's like, well, I didn't know she was my mom until now. I literally have no idea where he said that she was hot. I guess, I guess we can just assume that if he doesn't immediately introduce a woman as disgusting, we can assume that she's up to his standards. Greg erases all of the aliens' memories of him so they can't come after him again, and the body tells him what a good guy he is for not just killing them all. Chapter 24 is called Mother. Anyway, Utopia's lit, guys. Greg still doesn't have any friends, though, besides a literal clone of himself and his pedophile girlfriend, who, might I add, wants to be impregnated. And he doesn't ever have to worry about saving the world again because everything is perfect and great forever. The end. Thank God. That was the worst thing I've ever read in my life. I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. Of the hundreds of books that I have read in my life, that was the worst. That, that was the worst one. And oh boy, was it a finale to this book trilogy to me talking about Onision on the internet. I, I don't know if I had a good time, but I certainly had a time. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in another video next week, which will be the, the full version of the intro to this video. Um, I have so much footage from that day and I think it's hilarious. So I'm gonna make it into a full video for your viewing pleasure. Remember to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and buy my merchandise. Okay, that's the end. Bye. <laughs>